welcome everyone to Words and Music 2022. Let's give it up. That's the best I can do. Okay. So, um, hello everybody and welcome. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Words and Music for allowing us to kind of discuss the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press, um, which kind of through our conversation today we'll learn just how important this press was. Um, um, I was recently um, invited by Maxine Cassin's son to take over the press. Um, and in my typical fashion, I kind of mulled it over for like months before I did anything and said yes. Um, but that's kind of how I roll. Um, but I'm really honored to kind of have that, um, that responsibility and the task of bringing poetry um, to us. So joining me today, um, John Geary, served on the editorial board of the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press from 1988 until 2012. Um, he's published seven collections of poetry, uh, including Davenport's Version, A Gallery of Ghosts, and Have It You Now, as well as criticism on uh, poets Gertrude Stein and Marilyn Chen, um, a, you know, kind of a, a wide range. Uh, his award-winning collection, the Enemies of Leisure was just issued by Red Hand Press, um, and um, he uh, hit, and Cross Cultural Ezra Pound was uh, a book that he co-edited with Walter Bauman and David McKnight um, that was published by Clemson University Press. His work has appeared in journals throughout the U.S. and Europe. It's been translated into ten languages. Um, he's a research professor of English at the University of New Orleans. Um, he directs the Ezra Pound Center for Literature, Brunnenberg, Italy, and he's the secretary of the Ezra Pound International Conference. Um, so John, John Gary. And then also joining us today is Martha McFerrin, who received an MFA from Warren Wilson College. Um, she's the author of six books, um, including Women in Cars, for which she received the Marion Moore Prize, Archaeology at Midnight, and most recently, The McFerrin Plot. Her poems have appeared in Georgia Review, Shenandoah, um, the Southern, Southern Review, and many other journals and anthologies. She's the recipient of an Artist Fellowship in Literature by the Louisiana Arts Council, a Yaddo Fellowship, um, and a National Endowment for the Arts uh, Creative Writing Fellowship. She's a native of Texas, um, she's in, she lives in New Orleans with her husband, uh, Dennis Wall, who's a wood turner. Her um, collection, Delusions of a Popular Mind, was published by the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press. What year was that? 1983, I think. Let me have a look. I have one of the few copies left of it. Um, so um, she, her work, of course, was published with the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press. Um, kind of before we kind of launch into our conversation, I really wanted to talk a little bit about Maxine Casson, um, who ran the press. She was a native of New Orleans. Um, and I remember kind of when I first met her, she, it was like kind of, Two, two natives meeting. You know, there's always kind of like this connection between people um, who are from New Orleans, um, and I definitely shared that with her. She grew up uptown. Um, she lived on General Pershing Street. Um, she received an MA in philosophy from Newcomb. And she married Joe Casson, who was a Bataan Death March survivor. Um, she started, uh, they had a son, um, Dan Casson, and then she started the press in 1955, or in, 1950, in the 1950s, with Richard Ashley. Um, and so that was something that, that she began. Um, and 
the press itself operated maybe for, I would say, about 50 or 60 years. Um, she published important writers early in their careers. Donald Hall, William Stafford, Rayburn Miller, Sylvia Plath. Um, these were people that she published. Jeff Munsterman, who is kind of a co-editor with me at the press, he's been tasked with, with kind of going through Maxine's papers and books, just volumes and volumes of stuff at the house on General Pershing. And he found a letter that was directed to Richard Ashman, and it was sent by Anne Sexton. And Anne Sexton wanted to kind of know about the status of her poem. It wasn't published in the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press, but she really expressed what was so amazing in the letter was she expressed like how she just waited for the mail every day, you know, and how she waited to get like to find out news about poetry. That's something I think that we've definitely lost. We don't really get things in the mail anymore. It's usually sent by email or text. So just kind of the, the amount of, the number of poets that she published, just absolutely amazing. Um, the press also published poetry collections by Everett Maddox, um, by Malika Favorite, um, Illuminated, Illuminated Manscript, um, Rayburn Miller, um, Martha McFerrin, um, Delusions of a Popular Mind, and by Ralph Adama, who was supposed to join us here today, but who's feeling under the weather. And um, his book was Hanoi Rose. Um, I think it's worth noting, too, that the press also published the first Maple Leaf anthology. Um, and I think that's significant now because the Maple Leaf, the series has started back up um, after being on a COVID hiatus for many, many years. But that first um, anthology was published by the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press. Today, kind of what we're planning um, for the press, the first publication is going to be an anthology of um, poets who have read at the Poetry Buffet. Um, we have over 100 poets um, whose work will be featured in the anthology. And we're going to um, really anticipate maybe that coming out uh, perhaps sometime late spring um, of 2023. So um, that's kind of what we have uh, going on with us, and please stay tuned. So um, I kind of wanted to ask um, both Martha and John about Maxine and kind of maybe John I think you can probably answer this because you kind of work with Maxine so much kind of reading <coughs> poetry what do you think she valued in poetry I, I mean I, I I know in her work um, she often wrote about kind of quotidian things things every day but she kind of <coughs> took that to another level um, I'm thinking of a poem of hers where she writes about their Chevy Impala that's going down Elysian Fields and it might not make it, and then she kind of reflects on Elysian Fields and kind of the Greek, uh, kind of, um, you know, kind of the Greek uh, meaning, connection with, with um, Elysian Fields. So what do you think she really valued in poetry? I mean, it's a hard question, yeah. maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Um, I think the, the, if you if you never had the opportunity to meet Maxine uh, or to have a conversation with her, then I think the first thing you need to know is that she had a singular voice. I mean, she has a singular voice in her poems, but she had a singular voice in her vocal cords, uh, and she. She was, from the very first time I met her, unlike anyone I had met before, and unlike anyone I met after that. Um, she had a way of talking that if you were not careful, you would be there for the rest of the day, if not for two days. 
because she knew how to have a conversation that was endless. Uh, and the one of the uh, so when I would we had long, long phone conversations. Even though for a number of years we lived within two blocks of each other and would visit, but we would also talk on the phone. And uh, she she um, was the combination, as Gina says, of someone who was focused on the, the flowers in her backyard or on who lives across the street, while at the same time she's thinking about uh, the space program or Russian poetry. Uh, and the, the, together with the sound of her voice, the, her sensibility was that of like no one I have known. Uh, she was a constant visitor to the uh, uh, Ladder Library. Uh, when she was able to do it. She was working, she worked in real estate, even though she was committed and immersed in poetry. And she was very discerning as a real estate agent, um, uh, not always to the happiness of her, some of her tenants. Um, uh, but she was about as worldly as you can get for someone who might not much cross the street uh, in an incredible combination. So to try to approach that question is, is difficult for me because it was so singular to her. She would, because we did talk a lot, she would receive a lot of manuscripts for her press after this. I brought this in case people haven't seen it. This is the, this is the complete edition of the New Orleans Poetry Journal. Uh, uh, that it started in, in 1955 and it lasted to like 1958, I think. Um, it was not a long-lived journal, as most poetry journals are not, uh, but it has a remarkable clientele, a remarkable number of contributors. If there was some time, I would love to read a couple poems from the, such as Plath's poem. Um, uh, but she, as, as a poet, and then as an editor, she had her own very discerning way of receiving and, and thinking about poems. She read one poem at a time, and you would not be able to predict whose poems she would like and whose poems she would have questions about. There was no consistency with that, except the consistency of Maxine. Uh, uh, I mean, artistry was very, very important to her. And that, that kind of, you know, she, she needed to find the music. But in terms of subject matter or range or uh, uh, style, she was wide open. She was really wide open. But you always knew, even if she wouldn't say it, which poem she liked and which ones she did. She had a really good way of doing it. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, when I was doing the first book, she said to me, I think you maybe I'll do your book. And I said, you mean the folklore material that I do right? She said, oh no, not the folklore material, the weird stuff. And uh, she did it. I did the weird stuff with her. Uh, but she was, as to you could get, because I've really crafted a conversation with her indefinitely. When my husband would give me getting by the telephone, he said, you sit down in a comfortable chair, he would say, hello, Max, and he'd go get me a drink. <laughs> you know, I was going to be there a while. <laughs> so you could be a couple of fingers of scotch and I discuss everything with my feet indefinitely. But I figured a way to extricate myself. You know, you'd be taking at least one hour, every morning, every two hours. She was not a person who, you know, there was not a succinct conversation. She talked like mean, a butterfly. She, and, and, but to me, like, her conversations almost reminded me, like, of a, of a, the, the tale of a comet. You know, like they would just like they would just kind of go on to that length. You yeah. know, float. Yeah, she float like a butterfly bird. Yeah. And like Martha says, if if it was time, if you had some other appointment to go to, you needed to try to say about forty-five minutes before you needed to leave. I think I need to leave now <laughs> um, because she, well, well, but she, because and if, if it, you know what she would do is she'd say, well, tell me about this. When she thought you were about ready to finish the conversation, she would ask you the most interesting questions she had asked over the last three hours at that moment. 
So you couldn't just say, well, we'll talk about that next time. She would draw you into that. And she would listen to what you said. And then she would develop from that. And then the next thing you know, it's like 40 minutes later, it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm just, now I'm late. But then she'd ask you another question. It's, it was a remarkable talent, remarkable talent that she had. That no one, I mean, no one would really say that to her because <laughs> it wouldn't work. Yeah, no, but she, she, I mean, I, re I remember I was, um, I one day made uh, the mistake, this had to be like maybe back in the late 1980s, I made the mistake of calling her from my place of employment. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that conversation went on, you know, and and my boss came in the room. It was like an hour and a half long conversation, and my boss was like, "Who were you talking to? You know, why were you on the phone that long?" But you really couldn't get out of the conversation. Um, and so I guess like kind of my thought was, or my question was like. And I think you answered it, John. Like, did she look at each poem like with that kind of level of curiosity and that kind of level of response, really? I mean, so was each poem kind of and 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 to clarify, um, for someone who had that ability to prolong a conversation beautifully, it's not the it's not a sign of the style of her poems. Her poems are succinct and, and, and precise and it, it, usually quite short. You would not the same person would do both the poems and the conversation. You really wouldn't. That's right. And the poems have left this logic to them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I mean, that was kind of one of the things that I wanted to talk about was just kind of like <coughs> this, you know, kind of, you know, her, her style of personal expression and her style of artistic expression. They were two vastly different things. Um, and her work usually was very, very succinct. Um, she was certainly not something, you might have had epic conversations with her, but you really never had like an epic, uh, you know, an epic poem for hers. I think she's like a lot of uh, New Orleanians. Um, this is her first book. Uh, which was published by Alan Swallow in Colorado, uh, which was a very uh, highly respected series when it came out in, uh, in the U.S. I think it's 1962, something like that, is the date of this book. Um, a Touch of Recognition, 1962, yes. And I mean, even if you, you can see that the poems in it are, are really like this, the book itself, they're, they're short. Poems. It's a really wonderful book to read, and it's a formal, most formal poems in here that she was writing when she first came out of uh, uh, from Newcomb, uh, and she was working in this office uh, as a kind of administrator in a in a medical office that was Dr. Ashman, and they decided together that they would start this press. The, I'm sorry, this journal, the New Orleans Poetry Journal, but really it was Maxine's doing. I mean, he was very interested in it, but she it was really her kind of spur and her, her initiative. Uh, and she did almost all the work for it, as far as I can tell. She would never have said that to me, but that's what I gathered. Um, and she was establishing herself nationally as a poet of some regard for such a young poet at the time, you know, in her 30s, um, uh, and had this correspondence with William Stafford and James Wright and all these poets of her same generation, basically. But she didn't uh, travel much, so she was so she was local to New Orleans, and it's one of those things where uh, whoever it was that said it, I always attributed to Lafcadio Hearn, but I could be wrong. That if you uh, live in New Orleans, especially if you come from the outside, that Maxine didn't do that. But if you live in New Orleans, you sink down so low you end up in China. Uh, and there's a sense that Maxine, this, is, this was her home, this is where she lived. So she didn't do the kind of thing that uh, someone like Plath did uh, uh, in the 50s and 60s, which was a version of what people do now, which is to make the rounds, to 
get yourself more established, to, to get to be known in certain circles. So that she didn't publish a book for the long time, for a longest time after this, um, when she published The Other Side of Sleep, I think is, you know, Turnip's Blood. This is Turnip's Blood, it's 1985, so it's over 20 years between, I think I got that right, between one book and the next, uh, 1985. And she never published anything with the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press which is another thing that was a lesson for me. Uh, you know, she, she was the editor of that press, and she was the editor. And she separated that from her, her work as a poet, which she was doing all the time. And I'm looking forward to this collected poems that we've needed from her for 10 years. Uh, 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 and, then, and then she did this. The Other Side of Sleep uh, was her third collection, and Against the Clock, is her, what she calls her, new and neglected poems, <laughs> uh, which is again very, very typical of Maxine. She loved the cover of this book. Oh, that's Jeffrey Potter who did that. He did the cover of my book too. He was a protege of Clarence Laughlin. Right, right. This is, but this is actually a Clarence Laughlin photograph yeah. uh, of Maxine on her staircase in her house. Uh, and, and it's like a double exposure. It's, a, it's it's actually very characteristic of Maxine in her own house. She's a kind of a ghost in her own house. Uh, uh, she had a kind of ghostly presence, but a very present presence. I feel like she's still here. Um, uh, but that, that, because she was the kind of poet that she was, um, she was not, she was not making a big splash anywhere. She was just doing her work. And for those of us attached to academia, she also was not attached to academia, to her great credit. She was, she was operating as a poet in the world. Uh, so a lot of the things we take for granted in an academic setting about the relationship of poetry to academia was not really something that she was engaged with. So that the kind of professional side of it uh, uh, was not really of interest to her. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I really like, uh, you know, about her and kind of like seeing her kind of in action, definitely as a younger poet, um, but kind of seeing the way that she operated, like she wasn't really somebody who really wanted the limelight, um, you know, I mean, she was important, she had a presence, but, you know, it's not like she, I mean, she was very, very comfortable in her own home, and in her own city, um, and so, I feel like her comfort in the city um, really helped this journal, you know, because it, she really brought poets, you know, to the city without maybe physically bringing them here. They were here. Um, and so I think to me that kind of says maybe a lot about her love for the city. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah? Oh, yeah. She did take, she took a long trip abroad with all people, Clarence Lawson. She seemed to have a gift for cultivating people that most people would not want to be cultivating with. Um, right. Like Lawson, who was definitely a, a pain in the butt guy. And uh, Kate Ralph Brown, who was also a bit of a pain. She was very good at cultivating these people that you normally would not care to get along with. And she went across Europe with Joe and Clarence Lawson, and they saw a lot of things together. I, I cannot imagine her and Joe and Clarence Lawson together in a car going across Europe, but they did. Uh, I had no explanation as to why they would do that either, but she, uh, she was very good at keeping conversations going like that. She did know a lot. She knew a lot about uh, well, I should. She had a basic, basic knowledge of New Orleans, that's for sure. Because she, uh, she just lived it every day. But she, at the same time, uh, never knew where her head was half the time. So, so, what was it like when you published the book with her? Was there a lot of back and forth with the manuscript? Was it? No, uh, not really. She. Uh, like I said, she, we were, I first met Maxie when I first came to town. So about a week after I had come to town, I went to the first meeting of the Poetry Forum, the New Orleans Poetry Forum. 
And Maxine was there too. She was her first meeting at the New Orleans Poetry Forum. She probably got into a big fight with Charlie, Charlie, uh, I think it was last name now. Uh, but a uh, teacher taught at uh, Jesuit prep, I think. Diego Vallis, you're talking about? Charlie Diego Vallis? Yeah, Diego Vallis, yeah, yeah. She got into a fight with him about something, I don't know what, but uh, that's the first time she'd come to the book for a week, but she came very often, actually, before. And so we, we got to know each other's work pretty well. And like I said, when she decided to start the press, she said, the first thing I'm going to do is Everett. Then I'm going to do Charlie Black's book. Then I'm going to do your book. And she did do Everett's first, of course, the Everett Maddox song book. Then she did Charlie Black. book. Charlie Black was Charles Black, a distinguished jurist. He was a lawyer uh, who uh, he was on the, the uh, committee that argued Brown versus the board, the school board. Topeka. Uh, was in Topeka. Uh, Brown versus Topeka, he was on the committee that argued that at the Supreme Court level. He was primarily a maritime lawyer, but he was a Texan by nature. He lived in Austin for many years, growing up, and he still stayed in Texas until the end. And I haven't actually read him, I haven't the faintest idea. But I think he gave her a great trouble that she would give somebody else on the telephone. She came to me while she was doing the book. Periodically, I get a phone call and I hear this voice going to be Maxine! <laughs> and it would be Charlie Black. And uh, so he was a well known person for basically maritime law. He could speak Icelandic. He could spend so much time in Iceland. He said it was the last civilized place. And he uh, came to you all to read a reading. And he then uh, went over to Tulane to see some people over there. The lawyers came running at the teacher, reading the law, the law faculty. Hey, Mr. Black, please come, please come to the classes, please. And he said, no, damn it, I'm a poet here. I've had to read poetry, I'm not going to read it law to anybody here. And he was really, they told me to be seen as a poet for that occasion. But he was really a fun, he was a fun man, he really was. He was fun to be around. And when she got to run, like I said, you wouldn't publish my folklore material. She said, no, I wouldn't publish the weird stuff. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty weird. The first book of the weirdness got me attention. <laughs> I said, I thought of copies all over the place. Would you, would you maybe read a couple of poems from Delusions of a Popular Mind so we can kind of get a sense of the weird stuff? Well, I'll read you the one that got me, probably lost me a job with the Historic New Orleans collection. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is so dry. Uh, I went there to apply for a job at the library at the Historic New Orleans collection. I went in the first door, front door of the librarian's office. She said, Oh, I've been reading your book. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> Cowboy on the P, a girl's guide. Believe me, the real thing isn't exceptionally tall. He is narrow and tough like an unmasticated stick of Niedermeyer's beef jerky, with a rear end the size of two hardtack biscuits and a dis disproportionately big six gun. With too much up front and nothing much behind, he has trouble finding jeans that fit and is therefore rather awkward for wearing pants. Also, this deranged fit makes him walk well, like he can't shut his leg even when he can't. He wears no whaling sizes around his neck or anything Italian, only in the case of a noose or pair of hands. He does anything, he does not know why he did it, because it had felt mighty good at the time. He will not strike a lady unless she slugs him with something that has a jagged edge. He will invariably call her ma'am, even while tying her wrist to the only swore of cactus within 20 miles. My friend Elise thought she picked up the real thing at the Tolingua chili cook-off. But she was deluded. One thing he kept making phone calls, even at the Dixie branding iron, 
to whisper and sell, for God's sake, sell. Instead of wild turkey, his belt buckle said he had hunting. And one night, finally, she woke near three and found him masturbating to the uncorked belly of her pig piggy bag. But the vaccine he used to quote all the time was one of uh, called going public about publishing your poetry. Because so many people say, I never published my poetry, it's too intimate, it's too personal, I never do that, I never expose myself to the wet masses of the world. And she got the same way about being a poet publisher of poetry. If I have poems I've never shown a living soul, he says to me, smiling at his cuticle. You know it's a personal thing. I feel like Richard Denning in The Creature from the Black Lagoon, when Richard Carlson turned on him by the Amazon and sneered, you only got the ichthyology for the money and the glory. To what she used to say, I got the ichthyology for the money and the glory. <laughs> I thought of asking people if they had delusions. <laughs> so, I don't know that many copies of the book left. It sold pretty well. And uh, I only have five or six left myself. They're going to an archive somewhere. They, it's uh, hard to find them. Mm -hmm. So, how is she, like, in terms of maybe promoting the press? I mean, like, um, certainly with the journal itself, um, what was kind of her her approach to that, John, like, were there, would there be readings, what would she, what was her approach to kind of getting the journal out in the world? Uh, frankly, I don't think she had a She problem. had an approach. She, she did not have one. one. Okay. She gave me, some, gave me some letterhead paper and said, go to it, kid. <laughs> and I took the letterhead paper and I did, wrote letters under her name to, I don't know how many people. You know, yes, sir, I wrote in my new book, new book I've just published on <laughs> Cecilia Maxine Cassett, I signed it all in the Maxine's name. And uh, so it kind of everywhere. They turned up with a lot of reviews that way. Okay. But Maxine didn't do anything. <laughs> and it's one of those ironies about poets that the poets have the, the, the popular reputation of being completely out of touch with the world and and not being worried about the daily concerns. But if you actually are that way, then you actually don't get seen. And Maxine actually was that way. So she didn't, she, she played, you know, somebody else needs to do that for her. Uh, uh, and because the body of work that she left is so impressive, I think that's, it's only a matter of time. Uh, uh, when I first got to New Orleans, I was hired to come here by Rayburn Miller, who was a close friend of hers. And he was at least as bizarre uh, and idiosyncratic as she, and probably more so. But they were great friends in their strangeness. Uh, Rayburn was a person who did not like to eat in the company of other people, for example. Uh, so when uh, when he was having lunch, uh, he was my boss at the University of New Orleans, he was the chair. When he was having lunch, he would close the door and nobody would, would uh, have access to him because he was eating. Uh, uh, and he was also a very particular poet, which is what he shared with Maxine. And by and by, she published his book, uh, what was one of the important book, books that she published. Okay, she specialized in people like that. She was people that nobody else could get along with and she basically didn't feel like getting along with her. And he, he had gone to the University of Iowa MFA program in the 1950s. He worked with Donald Justice, who was his teacher. They edited the book, a collection of Weldon Keyes poems that's still in print, that's an important collection that sort of re, did rediscover Keyes. Uh, and then after he finished the degree, Rayburn went back to Austin. He was from Austin. And he uh, got a degree in uh, public you know, accounting, accounting, and he was working as, a, as an accountant. And he came to New Orleans to visit, and a friend of his here said, there's a university they're opening up here, up the street. Maybe you might be able to go there and get a job in the things that you do, you know, in poetry. 
So he did, and he got, he got his job at UNO um, based on the fact that it was a new university and no other poets had come around <laughs> to the doors. Uh, and he spent the next like 40 years there, I think. And he died in 1990, kind of suddenly. Um, uh, but the first thing he said to me when, when I had a conversation with him uh, when I came to start my job is that you have to go meet Maxim Cassidy. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing he told me to do. Uh, and I probably didn't do it that day. But, I mean, it took me a while, but he, he had, he, she was very important to him. Uh, and, and there were rivalries. The, the, the sense that I got, and I don't know that you can confirm this, is that there was Maxine over here and there was Lee Gru over here. And uh, if you were found in one place, you might, they might look at you at a scance in the other place. <coughs> in Everett, I think you had to leave house all the time. Pardon? I think you a lot of the workshops. So. I, th I think that's probably before I came to the city. That might have been before I came to the city. Because I'm not the, I, I, I don't doubt you. I don't doubt you at all. I'm just telling you that that was the reputation that was told to me as a young poet. I think, I think that may be somebody who, See, I would not understand the situation. I actually wondered about that because I, I know when I was growing up here, um, there was a real distinctive distinction between whether or not you lived uptown or you lived downtown. And, you know, I think that, you know, I would say Lee Rue was definitely a downtown poet because she lived in the bywater, whereas Maxine lived uptown, you know, and so. Jonathan and my husband and I were we were talking about that last night. Like, we didn't know. Like, I, I kind of hypothesized to him. I mean, I'm glad you kind of brought this up because I thought that maybe there might have been not really a rivalry, but just some sort of I don't know. You know, like they weren't. I don't think they were at each other other's no. throats or anything like that. No. But but no. Lee was doing her thing, and maybe Maxine was doing her thing. And they were definitely like kind of like in opposite points of the city. Right. Um, and Maxine so, was there so much at the time. That's how I got to know her. And uh, she, uh, I think she got Robert Stock. He's been dead for many years now. Maxine and Robert became very close. That's purely because he never competed with anybody. He didn't believe in competition. He didn't believe in taking sides. He didn't believe in disapproving of anybody for anything. Sometimes at the point of almost being absurd. Uh, but she uh, evidently never cared for that somebody was plotting against her. He felt somebody was plotting against her once in a while, somebody in academia or something like that. She said, let them. Uh, who cares? Uh, but definitely, she. Uh, she was friendly with Maxine all the time, and uh, she really. No, I just don't see Lee and Harry refuse Maxine. Maxine, she became so close with Robert, though. And Robert sometimes became kind of contrary. Uh, that might have rubbed off on her a little bit. But I don't, I don't think there was any animosity between Maxine and Lee. Whenever I saw them together, they were perfectly fine together. Yeah. But there was just a sense that these were the kind of the two poles of poetry in the city at the time. Uh, at least that's how I was kind of informed about it. And um, well, you said too many operas, but all the time with the poetry people when you lived here. Right, right. That, well, that never a, that clear a distinction. Uh, I think that might be more of a distinction between the maple leaf cloud and the poetry form. I mean, that, that became the manifestation of because of the two different reading series that were going on at the time. But the important thing, I think, for this forum is that Maxine pretty much single-handedly sustained the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press. She did the journal, and then when the journal uh, went defunct, she just didn't fold up shop. She started this series that she, as far as I can tell, funded almost entirely by herself. Uh, you know, she kept, the, she, she always, whenever I spoke to her, we're talking about a later time now, but she, she um, always said, there's money in the, in the account. She made sure there was always some money in the account, enough to do the next book. She might only do one book in the year, 
but she kept it going, and she kept it up to the standards that she had in mind. Uh, and again, it's something I admire that she wasn't affected by sales, she wasn't affected by trends, she wasn't saying, oh, you know, there were plenty of people who wanted to be published with her, and she would not be unkind, but she wasn't the, like, inviting a lot of people, like, let's have five or six books published because it will be good for the press, which, would, which might have made business sense to her. She just wanted it as she envisioned it. And that's the, that's the challenge to you, Gina, because with that kind of vision of hers, at least from my point of view, how to both uh, recognize and honor that, but also then to find a way to extend it so that it's, it's the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press and not just Maxine Cassin Press. Right. Yeah. I mean, one thing that uh, I'll say, kind of speaking about that, is she had the foresight to buy, I mean, we have tons of ISBNs now. Um, and she, you know, she was the one who bought them. And so it's not like, oh, well, now we have to get ISBNs. I mean, all of that really is kind of in, in place and it'll be easier to keep the press going kind of as a result of that, you know? And so, um, so I do know that we're gonna start off with, um, you know, kind of with this anthology. Um, and I think it's right because the Buffet anthology, it, it, it too kind of has Maxine on it because the Buffet took place at the Ladder Library and that was Maxine's like, go to library. She was there quite often. Um, but then kind of moving ahead, um, you know, we're going to publish poets. Um, and I'm not really, I feel like maybe we'll do, in the beginning, probably two books a year, two collections a year. Um, but right now, we just we want to get the anthology kind of kind of out in the world, and that'll be 2023. Um, so Peter Cooley, kind of talking about something that you said, John, that you were told, like, you needed to meet Maxine, you know, that that was. So Peter Cooley shared recently that he was teaching in, in Green Bay, and um, he was told, like, about the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press. Um, and so, and this was early in the 1950s, probably, 1960s, um, and even up in Wisconsin, the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press was known. Um, so uh, that was something that, um, that was kind of interesting to find out. Robert, did you talk? He developed quite a crush on Maxine. And he wrote her a poem that they think was a depressive feeling to her. And uh, she gave it to him and uh, later was pleased to be kind of upset. And uh, I asked her, what happened to you? He said, oh, he, he gave me a poem, but I didn't understand a bit of it. And uh, it kind of a joke. did not read the poem with the understanding of what he was trying to tell him, but just as well, I think. But uh, that's a bit embarrassing for Robert, I think. Yeah. So, um, so talk a little bit, um, a little bit, Martha, about the New Orleans Poetry Forum. Um, and, and so that was, talk a little bit about that, like when you were going to the forum. Yeah. I was not there for the very beginning, but I was there during the most fertile period. We had any number of people who went on to publish books and go back and get a master's degree in literature or MFA uh, and leave. Drew Bateson was the heart and soul of it. As long as Lee was in charge, in her own lackadaisical way, because basically she ran her magazine, The New Law Review, which she inherited from Alice Caudell. Because there was enough money in the account, we published an issue of the magazine. And if there wasn't enough money in the account, then the magazine was not published, if that was that. So she uh, 
very laid back about everything. She wouldn't got an MFA herself about halfway through the time she was there. And I went and got one. <coughs> Bonnie Sodiat went and got one. And uh, Rick Trethaway, the father of Natasha Trethaway, was also there at the time. And uh, Bonnie he was pretty well known teacher. Carolyn Wright. Uh, who was also a teacher that got quite a lot of attention over the years. But there at the time when she was involved with Yousef at the time, Yousef Lumiata, who became got a few little surprise later on. And it was in Detroit. It did jazz at the time at one time. Uh, New Orleans, the interest in New Orleans was basically the music. But, uh, but it was a pretty eclectic group. We also had a longshore one, Jim Donahoe. And uh, Grace Bauer, who worked as a park ranger at the summer time, and Yellowstone, I think. And uh, Grace went and got an MFA too. She worked across Europe, hitchhiking way across Europe, picking berries, but she ended up with an MFA from them first. And uh, we all just sat there and wrote every week we bring something out, and we sit there and we talk about it. And we, we got to be pretty violent with each other at times. I mean, nobody hit anybody else. We would yell. We would yell a lot. And uh, nobody came. We, we got pretty tough with us after a while. We really didn't care. You know, we would just say, oh, you know, you never liked that kind of thing. Uh, somebody once said, I cannot take another squirrel pawn in my life. No more squirrel pawn. Uh, things of that nature. I know one time, uh, Jerry LaRubia, uh, I, I, I think I did it to her, she, uh, she took, I, I forgot it, but she told me the other day that I said to her, she was ready to pull the head, blue moon in it, blue moon, B-L-U-E-W-O-M-B, and I said, you cannot say that, you felt like the blue moon, blue moon, and she said, you're right, I can't do that, so, uh, I'm trying to make people are so sensitive because I think y'all we, we, we trusted each other. We didn't, we didn't worry about anybody being malicious. We trusted each other. And you were know, really, really be good. You had to be good. I that going anywhere, get the MFA was nothing I could How are we doing on time? Oh, oh people have questions. Okay, yeah. Five minutes, yes, yeah. okay, all right. Um, John, I was hoping that maybe you could read a poem for us, a couple, maybe a poem for us, or? I have souvenirs for people if they want it. Okay. Which is just a page of Maxine's poems. Uh, I also have, uh, um, I mean, it's, we're sort of in a mix here because I'm thinking of the press and the future of the press. And we're spending a lot of time talking about Maxine, which is as it should be, but I wish we had two sessions, one on Maxine and, and another one on the press. Um, but here's a, a, not a letter, but an email I got from her. You know, she, her house is still on General Pershing Street uptown, and it was seriously damaged by Hurricane Katrina. Her son, Daniel, and his wife, with their two children are living in Baton Rouge. Daniel's a cellist, a, a, a good, distinguished cellist, a very good cellist. Worked with the Baton Rouge Symphony and also an a, a, a ensemble group there, although I'm not sure he's more retired now. Um, uh, and Maxine and Joe, who himself is a remarkable, remarkable figure. Uh, whom you might know for 20 years without knowing that he'd spent four years in a Japanese prison camp because he was so modest about it. Um, uh, had, they had purchased an apartment, or they, I don't know if they purchased, they found an apartment in Baton Rouge so they could go and stay there to visit their grandchildren uh, for weekends. But after Katrina, they ended up living in that apartment uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, they both died in 2011. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think it was 2010, but within days 2010, of each other. 2010. 2010. Yeah. Uh, and they were both. Then they, they were very. They had been together for over 50 years, and and they were both hospitalized in different hospitals in Baton Rouge. 
went to see Maxine when she was in hospital shortly before she died, and, uh, and she wasn't really communicable at that point. Um, uh, but when she died, we, uh, people thought that Joe would die first. He was older, he had West Nile virus, he'd been in a death camp. I mean, he'd done all, he just survived. He was an amazing figure, very modest. Um, uh, uh, and, and she kept talking about coming back to New Orleans to, their, to her house. And I was also with my family displaced during Katrina, as many, many people were. And I had some long conversations with her by phone, long distance. And they were, they were some of the hardest conversations I've ever had in my life when I was trying to deal with moving around the country and listening to Maxine trying to deal with her house. And her house is a place that she had hopes for. She wanted to be able to have the house become a, 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 a kind of artist's home. Uh, Ralph knows this, uh, and, and we were hoping the University of New Orleans would make some sort of arrangement with her. I would still love it for that to be true, for visiting, <laughs> visiting writers to be able to live there. But she wrote this short email to me. Uh, this is in 2008. I hope to be in New Orleans on Thursday, April 17th, to meet with a contractor or two, also the trust director. These preservation people take a vested interest in a property they have identified as, quote, historic. I told them I am historic. No one is preserving me. And then she writes, you're supposed to smile. So that's, 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 that's the other Maxine, the one you don't talk to on the phone. That's the one who writes you a letter. Um, and I know our time is so short, but um, I wanted to read this poem of hers. It's better to, well, I'll, I'll read, you know, I wanted to read this poem of hers, which is perhaps her last poem. There it is. Specter. There are surely lines discernible on this white page, words I intended to write, thoughts that would materialize as though from invisible ink. When I look long at the white street, I can only see the outline of what is implicitly there, however faintly scripted. This illusory poem, those words that eluded me, meant to be heard and read, are now taking shape for you. All right. Well, um, we probably have time for like maybe one or two questions. Um, does anybody have any questions or? Uh, if her collections are a little bit harder to find nowadays and um, they're sort of scattered in different places, has there been any discussion of trying to compile a full catalog resume, like a full collected uh, edition of all of her works now that the press is back? In, in here again to bring her back into the public eye? would certainly like to do that. Um, John, are you working with UNO Press? Did I, did I hear that UNO well, Press might be? Th there has been talk about that. There's been talk about it for a long time. Yeah. There's a, there are a couple of problems with it. I mean, there are these four collections which could be collected. Uh, um, I'm not sure, and this is a, this is the other discussion. I'm not sure that the New Orleans Poetry Journal Press would be the place for it. Uh, I think it certainly could be the place for it, but I would like LSU Press, for example, to do it, or possibly UNO Press. But my association with them is not as strong as it used to be. Um, and the other problem is, such as the poem I just read, there are all kinds of poems that Maxine has that have not been collected in her books. So the editing task is a serious editing, editing task that uh, um, as soon as someone, the same person who's going to look at her house and be able to donate it to a, uh, a, an artist's cause, 
is interested in investing in that project, I would love to work on that project. But I can't do it just on my, I don't have Maxine's resolve, basically. Um, uh, um, but that, because in her house, there are poems and books, pieces of paper, I know this is true. And there are poems that have been appeared in journals, that somebody needs to find those. So it's a, I really appreciate that question, because it's absolutely true. And then there also needs to be a selected Maxine, because Maxine was not an uh, 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 inveterate reviser. So she has a lot of poems that have a lot of charm to them, but have not, I think she would admit, are not, are not uh, uh, polished. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be collected. But to put together a volume, a readable volume of her work in a selected poem, will really bring out her sensibility in a way that I think uh, uh, is, is, I think it's important for the city of New Orleans because uh, Maxine is, is New Orleans through and through, and like New Orleans, that means she's not conventional. She's not your image of New Orleans. It's the other, the real New Orleans. The Orleans, New Orleans underneath the surface of what the tourists look at. Is the, is the real culture of New Orleans. So the essay I wrote about her is that she's not your southern poet. She doesn't fit that at all. She's in the deeper side of, of the deep south. Uh, and this, and then a good selected poem will make that very clear. Very distinctive voice, but it would, it would represent the city in a way that, that I, uh, I think it should be done. So forgive that. Forgive me for saying that. Well, um, I think we're going to we'll probably run out of time. Um, I thank everybody for attending. Um, I thank Martha and John for uh, both being here um, to talk about Maxine, um, to give a little insight into who she was and how important she was to the city, um, and also for talking about the press. Um, so thank you all, and um, thank you to Words and Music for having this panel.